afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Protecting Futures, Building Capacity to Serve Children and Youth Impacted by America's Drug Crisis, hosted by the Office for Victims of Crime. This time, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stacy Phillips, Victim Justice Program Specialist with the Office for Victims of Crime, for some welcome remarks and to begin the presentation. Stacy. Thanks a lot, Daryl. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stacy Phillips, and I am a program specialist with the Office for Victims of Crime, and I'm happy to be here today to walk you through the pre-application, uh, this pre-application webinar. So I'm going to walk you through uh, OVC and our mission, and then I'm going to break down the solicitation. We're going to look at the project purpose, goal and objectives, eligibility, application and award timelines, required documents. We're going to talk through the application process, and then we'll answer some questions and answers at the end. So first and foremost, we are OBC, and our mission is that we are committed to enhancing the nation's capacity to assist crime victims and to providing leadership in changing attitudes, policies, and practices to promote justice and healing for all victims of crime. And so we support victims in tribal communities, state victim compensation and assistance programs. We have training and technical assistance as well as information and resources, victims of international terrorism and mass violence, federal agencies provision of victim services, survivors of human trafficking, as well as demonstration and service projects. So the timeline for this initiative um, has a couple of different really important dates. So our first date is the grants.gov deadline, and this is Thursday, June 9th. And then the just grants deadline is Thursday, June 23rd. Now we expect to make our awards no later than September 30th of 2022, and all project start dates will be on or after October 1st, 2022. As you can see in red below, um, sometimes there are delays when we're working out budgets. And unfortunately, no matter what the delay is, the start date will still remain October 1st, and you're not permitted to uh, work on the initiative until your budgets have been reviewed and approved. So in terms of eligibility, um, you can be county governments, for-profit organizations other than small businesses, nonprofits having 501c3 status, nonprofits that don't have a 501c3 status, private institutions of higher education, public and state controlled institutions of higher education, state governments, unrestricted, meaning open to any type of entity above, subject to any clarification in text field entitled as additional information on eligibility, as well as other. So this program is going to provide funding to support an entity that's going to collect, competitively select and fund sub awards to support direct services to children and youth who are crime victims impacted by the nation's drug crisis, as well as that same entity will provide technical ass assistance to the selected sub awards. So for this program, the following definitions apply. Drug or substance use refers to a person taking a drug, either prescribed or not, in a way other than it is intended to be used as well as poly victims, are victims or survivors of more than one type of victimization, such as sexual abuse, physical abuse, neglect, bullying, bullying, excuse me, and exposure to family violence, and those who have experienced multiple victimizations over a lifetime. And so children and youth who are crime victims impacted by the nation's drug crisis may be poly victims and therefore have complex service needs, including a potential need for support services to their families. This program is intended to address the complex needs of children, youth, and their families impacted by the nation's drug crisis. Under this program, OVC expects to make a three-year cooperative agreement award of up to $2 million for a lead entity and technical assistance provider to both develop and manage a subaward program and provide TA to subawardees. In partnership with OBC, the lead entity will competitively select up to 14 subawardee sites, and these will be service providers who specialize in substance use across the country to implement one to two year field generated projects ranging between $50,000 and $100,000. 
the subawardees will work toward creating replicable victim services, including multidisciplinary community response approaches for youth impacted by drug use. The subaward projects will also be required to address the needs of families and caregivers. The subaward program will make a priority those projects planned for communities that demonstrate high levels of crime related to substance use and for geographic areas where there are gaps in services for victims. The TA provider will support the project sites in the early identification of child and youth victims, as well as promote the establishment and expansion of sustainable community partnerships. So up to 750,000 of the award may be used to provide overall project management, technical assistance and oversight of sub awardees. So the ultimate goal of this program is to expand, enhance and formalize the service response to children, youth and families who have been harmed by exposure to drug use. The objectives of this program are to ascertain new ways of identifying children and youth impacted by substance use who need victim services, increase partnerships as well as the availability of and access to direct services and multidisciplinary response strategies for children, youth and families who have been harmed through exposure to drug use, including those experiencing poly victimization enhance knowledge and build the capacity of service providers to serve this population more effectively and broadly share innovative crime victim response models that can be replicated in other communities and jurisdictions to address this population. In terms of deliverables, the entity will create and disseminate of a solicitation to competitively select in close consultation with OVC up to 14 direct service providers for sub awards. The execution of the sub awards, uh, sub awards, provision of survivor informed TA created specifically for the sub awards, provision of program oversight and management, development and execution of a monitoring plan for overseeing the work of the sub awardees, and facilitation of calls, webinars, and other meetings between and among sites to facilitate discussion and information exchange. Deliverables continued will also include provision of peer-to-peer -peer consultation and networking opportunities among the sites to promote problem solving and exchange resources, a provision of technical assistance and capacity building to subawardees to increase their knowledge of effective responses to drug use related crime victimization, including poly victimization, trauma informed services, resources for victims of crime, state compensation programs, victims' rights, legal remedies, and other tailored assistance identified by subawardees, analysis of performance data from subawardees to determine if the programs are meeting the stated goals and objectives, and development of a guide about promising approaches to addressing drug use-related crime, including poly victimization, based on the work of the program's subawardees. So OJP is committed to advancing work that promotes civil rights and racial equity, increases access to justice, supports crime victims and individuals impacted by the justice system, strengthens community safety and protects the public from crime and evolving threats and builds trust between law enforcement and the community. So priority considerations supporting executive order 13985 advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government. So consistent with this order, the term underserved community refers to a population sharing a particular characteristic as well as a geographic community that has been systematically denied a full opportunity to participate in aspects of economic, social, and civic life, or whose members have been historically underserved, marginalized, and adversely affected by inequality. Such communities include, among others, Black people, Hispanics and Latinos, Native American, and other indigenous peoples of North America. In support of Executive Order 13985, OJP will A, give priority consideration to applications that include projects that will promote racial equity 
and the removal of barriers to access and opportunity for communities that have been historically underserved, marginalized, and adversely affected by inequality when making award decisions. To receive this consideration, the applicant must describe how the proposed projects will address potential inequities and barriers to equal opportunity and or contribute to greater access to services for underserved and historically marginalized populations. For priority area B, we will give priority consideration to applicants that can demonstrate that their capabilities and competencies for implementing their proposed projects are enhanced because the applicant or at least one proposed subrecipient that will receive at least 30% of the requested award funding as demonstrated in the budget worksheet and budget narrative identifies as a culturally specific organization. To receive this additional priority consideration, applicants must describe how being a culturally specific organization or funding the culturally specific subrecipient organizations will enhance their ability to implement the proposed projects and should also specify which culturally specific populations are intended or expected to be served or to have their needs addressed under the proposed projects. Culturally specific organizations are defined for purposes of this solicitation as private, nonprofit, or tribal organizations whose primary purpose as a whole is to provide culturally specific services to, among others, Black people, Hispanics and Latino, Native American and other indigenous peoples of North America, including Alaska Natives, Eskimos and Aleuts, Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians and or Pacific Islanders. Addressing these priority areas is one of many factors that OJP considers in making funding decisions. Receiving priority consideration for one or more priority areas is not a guarantee of an award. So in terms of the um, federal award information, we will, or we are planning to make one, one award up to $2 million. The period of performance start date is October 1st of 2022 and the period of performance is 36 months. Now, OVC may, in certain cases, provide additional funding in future years to awards made under the solicitation through continuation awards. OJP will consider, among other factors, OJP's strategic priorities, a recipient's overall management of the award, and the award-funded works progress when making continuation award decisions. This solicitation and awards, if any are made under this solicitation, are subject to the availability of appropriated funds and to any modifications or additional requirements that may be imposed by the agency or by law. In addition, nothing in this solicitation is intended to and does not create any right or benefit, substantive or procedural enforceable at law or in equity by any party against the United States, its departments, agencies, or entities, its officers, employees, or agents, or any other person. This award would be made as a cooperative agreement, which means that there will be substantial involvement between the awarding agency and recipient during the performance period. The awarding agency closely participates in the performance of the program, and you can see more for more information in the OJP grant application resource guide. So now on to the application and submission information. Applications must include the following. These elements must be included in the application submission to meet the basic minimum requirements to advance to peer review and receive consideration for funding. So you've got to have a proposal abstract, proposal narrative, which will include the statement of the problem, project design and implementation, capabilities and competencies, plan for collecting the data, budget worksheet, and budget narrative. Remember, if you fail to submit any of the required documents, your application will not be considered for funding. So a proposal, a proposal abstract is a clear and simple summary statement about your proposal. It should be no more than 400 words summarizing the proposed project, including the purpose of the project, primary activities, expected outcomes, 
the service area, intended beneficiaries, and subrecipients, if known, will be completed in the Just Grants web-based form. This abstract should be written in the third person and will be made publicly available on the OJP website if the project is awarded. As for the narrative, adhere to the proposal narrative formatting requirements. Be double spaced, use a standard 12 point font, have no less than one inch margins, not to exceed 20 pages, number the pages correctly. If the proposal narrative fails to comply with these length related restrictions, OBC may consider such non-compliance in peer review and in final award decisions. In addition for the proposal narrative format, the following sections are part of that narrative. Statement of the problem or description of the issue, project design and implementation, capabilities and competencies, plan for collecting the data required for this solicitation's performance measures. In the description of the issue, the section must describe the need for the project and provide a clear statement of how funding will support the project's value to the victim's field. Describe how drug use has contributed to increased rates of child and youth victimization across the nation, including poly victimization. Describe current gaps in victim services for children and youth and their families, as well as identified gaps. Describe the identified gaps in available TA to assist the above issues. So this section must describe the project strategy and discuss how the strategy will address the identified problems and support the goals and objectives. The applicant strategy or design must include a description of project phases, tasks, activities, and staff responsibilities, as well as a clear descriptions of the interim deliverables and final projects. The applicant must develop a week by week time task plan that identifies major activities and deliverables for the duration of the project period and the designation of staff responsibility. Submission of financial and progress reports must be included in the time task plan. As a separate attachment, the time task plan is not subject to the program narrative page limitations. For guidance on OVC's publication process, the publishing guidelines for print and web media are available online at ovcojp.gov and the following web address is listed in this PowerPoint, which you will be provided. So for capabilities and competencies, please include a clear description of the applicant's management structure and if the application is for continuation funding, must document the organization's success in implementing previous phases of the project include a description of the current and proposed professional staff members unique qualifications that will enable them to fulfill their grant responsibilities describe how the program will be managed and include an organizational chart or information describing the roles and responsibilities of key organizational and functional components and personnel include a list of personnel responsible for managing and implementing the major stages of the project, including selection criteria for those to be hired, detailed information about staff, and an organizational chart. If the applicant is seeking priority consideration under Priority 1B, it should describe within this section how being a culturally specific organization or funding a culturally specific subrecipient organization at a minimum of 30% of the project budget will enhance its ability to implement the proposed project. So as for your plan for collecting data, performance measures are parameters against which progress toward goals can be assessed, a common language linking your plans and your performance and consist of your program's inputs, activities, outputs, and outcomes, or otherwise known as a logic model. While this data satisfies the reporting requirement of your grant, it also provides an excellent opportunity to self-assess your program and your agency's processes. As a first step, review your program's performance measures, focusing on the numbers, narratives, or other data that you will need to collect to answer the questions posed by OVC. OJP will require each successful applicant to submit regular performance data 
that show the completed works results. The performance data directly relates to the goals, objectives, and deliverables identified in the goals, objectives, and deliverables discussion. Applicants can visit OJP's performance measurement page at www.ojp.gov performance for an overview of performance measurement activities at OJP. As for the budget worksheet and budget narrative, you must use the web-based form. The applicant will complete the Just Grants web-based form breakout costs by year reflecting 36 months total of project activity. Applicants can see the budget preparation and submission information section of the OJP grant application resource guide for details on the budget and associated documentation, such as information on proposed awards, proposed procurement contracts under awards and pre-agreement costs. For questions pertaining to budget and examples of allowable and unallowable costs, you can visit the DOJ Grants Financial Guide. So create a smart budget. Just like your objective needs to be smart, so does your budget. Your budget also needs to be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. Specific, be specific when listing all of your subcategories. Measurable, if you utilize the budget template within this book, then you will be able to adhere to measuring your budget appropriately. This is under the computation column of the budget. Achievable, to ensure that your budget items are achievable, your budget needs to make sense. Is there enough work for your project director to be hired at a full-time basis? On the flip side, do you have ample resources included in your budget to meet the objectives? If there is a required training for two staff to attend a three-day training in Washington, D.C., and your organization is based in California, would you only include $100 for training in the budget? No, you wouldn't. And also relevant. If you put your timeline next to your budget and are sure that each item is accounted for, then your budget should be relevant. If you listed hiring a project director in your timeline and discussed the project director's role in your project design, then it would be relevant to include a project director in your budget. On the other hand, if you did not include the project director in your timeline, timeline or project design, then it would not be completely relevant to include it in your budget. And last but not least, time bound. Your budget is usually listed year by year or for a certain duration into three years. It will be confusing for the reviewer. Some grant periods are less than a year and only for a specific season. Therefore, it is important to pay attention to what the duration is and even if you are applying for a federal grant and it is a three-year grant, they're going to want to see the budget broken down year by year. If you break down your personnel computations on an annual basis, but then clump all of your rent or supplies when the grant will be awarded, that won't work. That way you can be more specific with scheduling the grant budget so it makes sense. Applications also should include the following. This screen lists other documents to be included, as mentioned on the application checklist of the solicitation. Use the checklist in your review prior to submitting your application. The DOJ application submission checklist is another resource to aid you in developing your application. So these are what we consider the hallmarks of an outstanding application. Use simple and concise language. Ensure information is presentable and organized. Add tables, graphs, staff photos, and other images when possible while being mindful of the grant guidelines. Be realistic about how you will achieve goals. Get feedback from those who may run the project. Make sure the proposal is consistent with the solicitation. Check, recheck, and check again. Budget, grant requirements, references, and other details. Common reasons cited for a weak application, too ambitious or a lax focus, applicant lacks appropriate expertise to carry out the proposed project, no evidence of feasibility, do not assume reviewers are as familiar with the project as you are, as well as poor writing and errors. So now we are going to go over the application process. So this is a two-step process, and it's really in your benefit that we've made it into this way because of Just Grants. So first, you need to submit 
into grants.gov. And that is due on June 9th, 2022. That's when you're going to take care of all of your SAMS information. Then you have the submission of the full application into Just Grants and Grants.gov, which is due June 23rd, 2022. So the part of the grants life cycle, this part of the grants life cycle involves completing and submitting web-based forms, as well as the attachments that are requested based on the requirements in the published solicitation. The process of submitting an application in Just Grants begins in Grants.gov. Once you have located a funding opportunity with DOJ, you will submit an SF-424 and SFLLL in Grants.gov. If you are applying for funding from the COPS office, you will also submit a supplemental to the SF-424. This is the extent of the application requirements in Grants.gov. Aside from the SF-424 and the SFLLL, most of your application is entered in Just Grants. Your entity information is populated based upon entries made in SAM.gov and used in Grants.gov. You will have two application submission deadlines, one for Grants.gov and one for Just Grants. Most of the application requirements will be submitted from Just Grants. Each solicitation has an application submission deadline in Grants.gov. After this date, the solicitation is removed from Grants.gov and no one will be able to apply to it any longer. It is highly recommended that you check the due date in Grants.gov and try to submit at least 72 hours prior to the deadline to provide you with enough time to correct any errors and resubmit if necessary. Once the application has been submitted and validated in Grants.gov, it will be sent to Just Grants for completion. It may take several days for Grants.gov to complete validations and release it to Just Grants. Just Grants has its own submission deadline, typically two weeks longer than the Grants.gov deadline. For example, if your due date in Grants.gov is April 1st, then you have until April 15th to complete the application in Just Grants. Submitting early in both systems is recommended. In our example, if the due date in Grants.gov is April 1st and you submit March 15th, you will still have until April 15th to submit the Just Grants application. The Just Grants submission should include all items that are required in the solicitation. The Just Grants application submission is final. It's okay to enter preliminary information in Grants.gov if you haven't fully determined your budget or project scope. You will be able to edit and update all your entries in Just Grants. Some of the ways that Just Grants streamlines the process is that you are provided with the ability to use a web-based budget detail worksheet. Not only is this process more efficient, but it also establishes a shared structure and narrative for all of DOJ. Streamlined validation of your budgets allows the process of clearing new budgets much faster. Your organization, specifically your assigned entity administrator, has more control over users and award assignments and does not require intervention from DOJ to make updates to those assignments. The entity administrator defaults to your organization's eBiz point of contact, but as we saw earlier, that person can reassign the responsibilities to another user as needed. The Grants.gov login is separate from Just Grants. Grants.gov provides access to funding opportunities from multiple government agencies and is not managed by DOJ. We will provide a training video from the Grants.gov website in the next slide, as well as some screen sh screenshots of the site. Actually, I don't think we're doing that. However, if you have questions about Grants.gov, you will need to contact them for support. You will apply by selecting the option in Grants.gov to apply. You will log in using the email address you want to receive notifications. There is a workspace icon that will allow you to access to funding opportunities. Once you have determined a funding opportunity and applied, you will receive notifications from Grants.gov confirming the receipt of the SF-424 and stating whether the SF-424 and SFLLL were validated and submitted or, re or were rejected with errors. The notification will include an explanation for any errors. 
This is why it is a good idea to submit in Grants.gov at least 48 hours prior to the deadline to give you the time that you need to correct any errors. You will not be able to correct errors or continue with the application process once the deadline in Grants.gov has passed. Then applicants will submit their full application, including attachments in Just Grants at JustGrants.usa, I'm sorry, USDOJ.gov. Now, there are certain web-based forms that must be submitted directly into the system. Your proposal abstract and solicitation. For those who are return users, you will need to submit your goals, objectives, deliverables, and timeline just like before. Make sure your budget information is included in the budget detail form. And lastly, your disclosure of duplication and cost items. After you have submitted your application, you are probably wondering what's next. Once all the applications for the solicitation have been reviewed, the entity, then the entity will be notified, which all happens before September 30th. Please remember who your entity administrator and authorized representative are, for they will be notified when the deadline for applications will be changed. The system will also notify the application submitter, entity administrator, and authorized representative when the application has been received in Just Grants from Grants.gov. And the entity administrator will receive notification on when the award notification has been sent. If you have submitted your application, the status will be submitted. You may also see a banner that indicates that it is past due. This banner indicates that the submission deadline has passed, not that your application is past due. Just Grants offers training resources on the DOJ website. Once you have selected a topic to explore, you will open a page with training resources dedicated that, to that topic. Typically, you will find a job aid reference guide and links to step-by-step -step videos. These are very short videos. They are meant to be used while you are working, so don't feel like you need to set aside a lot of time to view them. They can really help you if you're in the middle of a task in Just Grants and just want to verify next steps. The job aid reference guides provide step-by-step -step instructions with screenshots to help you walk through a task. You can print these or view them on screen depending on how you like to work. They are also a great reference if you are in the middle of a task and you want to verify next steps. You will also find quick reference guides that will walk you step-by-step -step through specific tasks. There are two new quick reference guides in the performance reporting topic, navigating to a performance report and completing a question set and submitting a performance report. Just Grants office hours and application mechanics can be seen below. And as you can see, this solicitation incorporates the OJP Grant Application Resource Guide by reference. The OJP Grant Application Resource Guide provides guidance to applicants for the preparation and submission to OJP of applications for funding. If this solicitation expressly modifies any provision in the OJP Grant Application Resource Guide, the application is to follow the guidelines in the solicitation as to that provision. To assist potential applicants in developing strong proposals in response to our current funding opportunities, OBC hosts educational webinars for interested stakeholders to learn more about the program objectives and submission requirements. A question and answer session is held before the conclusion of every webinar. Sign up for news from OVC to stay up to date on webinars as they are scheduled. As you can see below, these are some important web resources and these are a reference throughout the solicitation and they may be resources for you as you prepare your application. So below you can see important contact information. Um, as for technical assistance, here is a list um, of contact information that will be important to you as you prepare your applications. First is grants.gov, and this is available to provide 
technical assistance to you when submitting the SF-424 and SF-LLL, and they can also be reached by phone and email. And then next is Just Grants, which is available to provide technical assistance on submitting the full application, and they also have a phone number and email. Finally is the OJP Response Center, which is available to provide technical assistance with programmatic requirements, and they also have a phone number as well as an email. So these are, again, your important dates. Um, you need to please, please, please submit by June 9th your SF-424 and grants.gov and your full application by June 23rd. And please sign up and stay connected to us. Uh, we have updates on new funding opportunities as well as other announcements on um, all the great things going on in OVC. The 2022 National Crime Victims Rights Week resource guide artwork has been available online and you can use it to help your organization plan for public awareness activities um, and really help to inspire your community and raise awareness of victims' rights. Our theme this year was rights access and equity for all victims and it really underscores the importance of helping crime survivors find their justice by enforcing victims' rights, expanding access to services, and really ensuring equity and inclusion for all. And go social with us at OVC. Like us on uh, our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, and watch some of our great YouTube videos. And we're gonna answer some questions now. Great, right, thanks, Stacey. So just sure. before we get into the Q&A, we'll just remind everybody on today's webinar that the PowerPoint recording and transcript for today will be posted to the OVC website. So uh, registration lists, we're going to send an email out to when those items are available. Uh, you'll receive those um, so you can access them if you need to go back and reference anything that was spoken to today. If you do have a question, far bottom right of your screen, three dots, hit Q&A, send to all panelists, and we'll go through those with the remaining time we have today. So the first question, are the PMT measures listed in the solicitation applicable to both the selected awardee as well as the 14 sub awardees? No, the PMT measures are that are listed will be for the lead entity. The sub awardees, those measures will be determined between the lead entity, um, you know, in collaboration with OVC. And, and let me add to that, those sub awardees will not be submitting like the PMT to OVC or anything like that. As a lead entity, um, that entity will be essentially monitoring those sub awards as though as OVC would be monitoring the lead entity, if that makes sense. So anything that is monitored will be going from the sub awardees to the lead entity, not to OVC. Great, thanks for that clarification, Stacey. That does actually answer the next question or two that's come in from that same person on the yeah. PMT data. Yep. Okay, the next one is there are newly formed 501c3 with a group of dedicated providers that are looking to provide direct service to victims as defined in this grant, would it be something that they would be able to apply for as far as eligibility? So I think that you would be um, apply, and I don't want to speak for this entity, obviously, but if they're looking to provide the direct service, then they would be possibly an applicant. Uh, so once the lead entity is selected, then in conjunction with OVC in probably the November, December, January timeline, um, the lead entity will put out a request for applications, um, and that will be what uh, is put out there to attract the applicants for those up to 14 sub awardees. So it sounds like the, the last question, the newly formed 501c3 that wants to provide direct services, that looks like an, an, um, an agency that would be uh, a good applicant for the solicitation that will come out once the lead entity is selected. 
Nothing else in the queue at this time, but we'll just wait a few more moments. If you do have a question, please go ahead and enter that. And in the meantime, I'll have this slide up for the rest of the webinar. If you do have questions about grants.gov, just grants, or anything with the solicitation itself, the OGP Response Center, this contact information will be useful to get answers to your questions. I think I'll just throw out there too, and I and I've said this through a couple of other application webinars. I, you know, I know that it's a pain to have to, you know, do all these things of submitting these early. Um, and I know because I've been on that side that you know you're it, you're doing a bunch of other stuff while you're also writing, you know, this application. And so sometimes we end up leaving it to the last minute. And what I've seen when that happens, knock on wood. But there always ends up being some type of error, and it and if if the applicant does not follow these guidelines of timeframes, and an error happens, in, and who knows what that could possibly be, um, you know, you would have to submit a waiver, and. In all honesty, it's very rare when those waivers are approved because they end up typically not being a technical issue. It it ends up being something like, oh, you know, had the entity of you know done say the grants.gov portion in the correct time frame, you know, the error would have been uh, fixed in time if that makes sense. And then what's really horrible about that is that these entities have worked so hard on these applications and then they can't, you know, they don't get reviewed. So I highly, highly encourage because it's it, it it's horrible to not be able to approve a waiver. And it's also horrible for, for the entity to not get their application even reviewed after they've worked so hard on it. So as challenging as it can be, please, 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 follow the guidelines and submit, you know, early into grants.gov and just grants. And also, you know, obviously I'm sure if there's repeat applicants here, they know that there have been some issues in the past with just grants. Please don't, you know, um, sometimes people I've heard will get frustrated and they'll just be like, oh, forget it. I just don't want to deal with just grants. I really hope if anything happens that you know, as as applicate as applicants, you call just grants. I've been told that they will really help you walk through the application process. We don't want to lose great applicants because of any glitches in the system. So highly encourage you to just kind of take that time to get into the system earlier than maybe when you originally anticipate. Regarding the eligibility again, are tribal governments included? Um, they're not listed, but that would be under other. So, yes. Absolutely. I think I saw under there too. It looked like, and I don't know if I, if I made it clear, but it says about, um, will the lead entity awarded manage all subawardees fiscal oversight for the 14 award maids and will this, or will this be completed in partnership with OVC? Um, it's kind of like that whole fiscal, uh, the, the lead into the lead entity. Essentially would be like OBC, right? So they would be monitoring the sub awards for everything for oversight. Obviously, OBC can be there for assistance, um, but they'll be monitoring those awards the same way that we do as grant managers of the entities that are the lead entities, you know, in pro in programs. Question has come in on where to send questions to. This particular person did send questions to the grants at ncds.gov, and that's correct. If you do have anything programmatic regarding the solicitation itself, that's who you want to contact. If you have questions about the systems or submitting the forms, um, technical based, you can contact grants.gov or just grants, depending on which part you have a question on. Most general questions would go to the OGP Response Center, then listed here. That's the end of the queue at this time, Stacy. We can wait a few more moments. Okay, so if there's not anything else, Stacy, is there anything in closing you wanted to mention? 
I don't think so. I think if you know, if you have any additional questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we're always really excited about our programs and we're always really excited about, um, you know, our applicants. So thank you. Great. So on behalf of the Office of Victims of Crime and our panelists, we want to thank you for joining today's webinar. This will end today's presentation.